One of the interesting discussions about digital currency is how cash-like it should be. And there's a sort of spectrum of opinion here from people who think that digital currency should have the anonymity of cash as one of its key features. Um, these are people who are wrong, but you know, in some cases quite well-meaning. Uh, and there are people who think that the danger trying to count in the wild is so great that were a central bank to issue a digital currency, it should track, trace, and monitor every transaction. And those people are wrong um, and fascists. So uh, we'll put those to one side, I think. Um, and instead, what we'll do is we'll try and talk about one or two of the issues and try to come to a slightly more structured discussion about the, so in other words, just saying, oh, it should be private or it shouldn't be private or whatever, doesn't get us very far. So what I'm going to try to do is just sort of construct an argument which opens up uh, a worthwhile discussion about where we should set the dials um, so that policymakers can make an informed decision. One, one sort of underlying principle of this is that we shouldn't be allowing technologists to make the choices for us and just decide how digital currency should work. It's much too important for that sort of thing. So, so anyway, so instead of just, you know, you're a fascist, you're a libertarian, you're a Nazi, instead of having that sort of discussion, I thought let's have a discussion, try to set out one or two principles about how this can continue. So um, slide two, here we go. So uh, this is me. I mean, you don't really need this because you can sort of read it later. Um, and I've written one or two books about uh, things of sort of general relevance to this. But one point I want to make is um, I, I wrote a book called Identity is the New Money, which went into the issues around um, anonymity and, and, and so on in, in, in quite some detail. So, so I, you know, I, I, I want you to feel I'm coming to this from a sort of reasoned position, basically. Okay, uh, why is it important to have the discussion now? Because, well, because we're here because of the Institute, obviously, but because, because CBDC is a real thing now. It's gone from being sort of an, an intellectual experiment to being um, a, a real thing out in the wild. And the, the pressure to do something about it uh, at the level, for example, of the Bank of England or the European Central Bank, or even in the US is, is steadily growing. So it's the thing and we need to start thinking about how it's going to work and, and what it means. Not just the technology, not, not just, you know, is it going to be a blockchain or not? Obviously it isn't, but that's, that's not the point for the moment. So, uh, so uh, why are we talking about it now? These things have all been around for years. Actually, I think part of the discussion is because China has sort of rather taken the lead here. There's a bit of a space race going on in different technologies. Um, you know, the issue of anonymity is only one of the sort of technological issues, but it's the one that we're focusing on today. Um, and there's some things to do with the implications of CBDCs, which I, I will touch on in a very small part of the end, because it's so that so the main part of this discussion is in the middle of that about influencing the sort of space race. OK, so what's the context for all of this? The context is. Um, the drivers for digital currency. So, so what I did here was I took the I took the European Central Bank report on drivers for digital currency, um, and I've improved it a bit by adding a. So they had those four categories, and I've added two more um, to sort of round it out. And one of the categories, which I think is obviously important, um, is is the issue of resilience, um, because it's not part of this discussion, but because I'm assuming that the digital currency infrastructure is going to sit in parallel with the existing digital money infrastructure. And the reason for there's ecological reasons for that, because we want a resilient infrastructure. We don't want digital currency sitting on top of, of the digital money infrastructure so that the next time Target goes down or something, nobody can buy anything at the shops. What we want is a parallel, resilient digital money, uh, digital cash infrastructure which can be used for digital currency. So resilience is a key element of that. There's lots of different issues around resilience. I want to start from the law enforcement position because I, I just want to uh, push home um, how important uh, some of these issues are. <clears throat> so, and I, I just want to bring sort of three things to your attention that we need to think about. So one is that there are all sorts of crimes that could be enhanced by, by cryptographic 
currencies of one form or another and digital currency. And certainly it would certainly aid and abet kidnappers um, if we had wholly anonymous digital currency out there. That would that would greatly add to their uh, their their toolkit. Uh, for, for obvious reasons, um, but it would also add to the toolkit of people who were trying to fake kidnappings, like um, uh, this example of one of the richest men in Norway, who um, who supposedly received a ransom demand in Bitcoin, um, which was sent to some untraceable place, and it subsequently turned out he'd murdered his wife himself. And so it would benefit kidnappers and also people who are pretending to be kidnappers. And I don't think that's a very good idea. I don't think we want more of that sort of thing. There are crypto native crimes like ransomware. Ransomware, if I was a, if I was head of IT at the Mafia, I mean, I would be directing most of my investment in this direction at the moment because the returns on ransomware are, are wonderful. Um, as you can see from the, from the picture there, um, I think the ransoms paid last year roughly tripled compared to the year before. Um, over half of them just come from spam emails. So no matter how many times you tell employees stop clicking on links in emails, they'll always do it. Um, and so the ransomware is out there running wild. Most organizations have been affected. And I mean that statistically, most organizations have been affected. And, and the money rolls in. But interestingly, the ransomware guys, because they're pretty smart, have started moving away from Bitcoin already. Um, and last year, there was a notable and discernible shift to work because Bitcoin's not private enough. You know, there's an immutable record of all of the transactions. But you're not very good if you're a criminal. Um, so they've been looking towards Monero and things like that. Were there to be an anonymous central bank digital currency that undoubtedly use that, I would have thought. The most interesting crime, and certainly one uh, where I would be, I would be putting my mafia R and D budget into at the moment, is assassination markets. This has the potential to be bigger than cryptocurrency exchanges. And this works by placing anonymous digital currency bets on the date of the death of public figures. So, you know, if there's, I don't know, some sportsman I don't like or some chancellor of the exchequer or, or you know, some tech giant CEO who's annoying me, um, I can put a fiver on the fact that he's going to die on, you know, whatever, I don't know, Christmas Day, April the 1st next year, it doesn't matter. And if lots of people don't like him, uh, then those, bat those bets will rack up and eventually there will be millions of pounds uh, resting on uh, millions of different bets on his date of death, at which point um, an intelligent uh, hired killer will uh, place a bet himself. So, like if I'm if I'm a if I'm the mafia hitman um, and I'm going to execute, you know, some tech CEO, I'll place the bet myself. So I'll say I bet he's going to die uh, tomorrow morning at nine a.m. Um, but when he does die tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., um, the person with the closest bet, in this instance, me, uh, gets all of the money in the pot. And uh, this is not a new idea. Jim Bell first put this forward in about 1995. Um, but it depends on the existence of anonymous digital currency to make it all work. So for a variety of reasons, reasons we don't want anonymous digital currency instead what's been quite interesting going on already the swiss central bank published um the uh, chomian cryptographic blinding example the uh, ecb was experimenting with this kind of r3 thing the idea of anonymity vouchers but it seems to me that they you know i, I don't understand the context for it. i mean these are solutions but we haven't had the problem sort of clearly illustrated yet so let me try and clearly illustrate the problem doesn't of course second party privacy which means you don't know who the counterparty is and third party privacy which means that no one knows who the counterparties are and i've divided each of those into two categories you'll see why because it's a legal obligation as a consultant to have a two by two matrix um so i've divided second party privacy into complete privacy where you don't know anything about the counterparty and what i've chosen to call partial privacy which means you know about them, you don't know their identity. So you know, you know that they're over 18 or they live in the UK or, or whatever. And the reason for that is because you want persistent reputations attached to these identities. When it comes to third party privacy, I've divided that into two categories, your unconditional third party privacy, which means it's computationally infeasible to link the person to the payment. Now, this is sort of Zcash and Monero and things like that, or the new Iron Fish protocol um, or it could be conditional in the sense that the link can be disclosed under certain conditions you know what i'm thinking about there of course is 
you know, the, basically the bank knows who I am, you don't. Um, and if I do something bad, then you can go and get a court order and the bank will tell you it's Dave Birch. So, so if you take those two by two and you put them into my matrix, that gives us four scenarios to explore. Um, two of which I think are completely unacceptable in Europe. So one is the idea of just turning everything back into Renaissance Italy and have sort of competing war bands roaming the landscape with no trust whatsoever. Um, and I don't think we particularly, I mean, I'm certain people will advocate for this, but I, I personally think we do not want the big brother scenario where all transactions are traced unconditionally all the time. So that gives us two real possibilities. One is to build a reputation economy. That's what I've called trade tribes there. And the other one, and I think this is the most likely one, is what I've called here little sisters. So instead of having a big brother, you have lots of little sisters. And so this means you have you have different people who know different links. And, you know, with, you know, should law enforcement approach them, little sister, the idea is that, you know, if you do something bad, little sister will tell on you. But there's no big brother. And we want it to be obviously computationally infeasible for for an attacker or, um, you know, a, a miscreant or, or corrupt government to be able to connect all those little sisters together. And you know, that requires some thinking on the cryptographic side. So if you take those as the possibilities, what do we have right now? We've got Facebooks or DM as it's called now, um, where you have conditional second party anonymity. And this is recognized by the fact that in the original, D in the original Libra white paper, Facebook were very clear, you know, the, almost the last paragraph of the last page says that you need a decentralized and portable digital identity to make all that work. That's because they recognize this issue about the pseudonymity of the wallets as being the core to having a scale trusted system. So in other words, I go and get a wallet from Barclays, I go and get another wallet from you know, Tesco, I go and get another wallet from Coinbase, I go and get another wallet from somebody else. Um, and they don't know about each other's wallets, but um, but they do know that it's me or they do know that someone knows that it's me, because obviously if I've got a wallet from Barclays, that means Barclays know who I am. So I should then be able to use my Barclays wallet to get an account with Coinbase or Twitter or Fa and it's none of their business who I am. Um, but they know that Barclays know who I am. So if something goes wrong and law enforcement need to track me down for sending some inappropriate pictures or something, uh, there's a chain that will lead them to me. Um, the other possibility, you know, the other live example that we see at the moment is People's Bank of China. And uh, that says it will be exactly the same as paper money, but just in digital form, which isn't quite true, of course, because unlike paper money, um, all the transactions we track, there is no unconditional third party anonymity here. <clears throat> so when there are transactions, the counterparties don't know who each other is, but the Central Bank of China does. Um, it's very important that they're allowing offline transactions in this environment. I certainly think that needs to be studied as part of the input to our design capabilities. So this is what it looks like in China. I draw your attention to exhibit A, which is the li clever little smart card that has the liquid paper screen on it. So for the small percentage of the population that don't have smartphones the problem is solved for them as well so i think you know what we want is something along these lines um but with um uh pseudonymity built into it and so this was this is me um making this point in the economist a couple of weeks ago it could well be that setting the dials in the right place on privacy becomes the most important element of the digital euro proposition. So in other words, why would people hold digital euros instead of digital dollars or digital one or something like that? Uh, I, I put forward, given the sort of structured nature of that argument, that we could construct a currency that has certain you know, privacy values attached to it, and that might make it valuable um, on a global scale. And, and from that, I go on to say, well, you know, you could imagine a sort of cold war for data where there are different currencies that have different you know, they set that dial in different places and, and therefore they have sort of different niches in, in global trade. But I haven't thought this through completely yet. So uh, don't pay too much attention to that map. OK, um, well, thank you very much. Um, I hope I gave you some food for thought and please feel free to email me to tell me where the obvious flaws in, in my argument are. Thank you very much.
a prototype uh, CBDC. So a prototype would be a smaller scale version, uh, not a full production system. But the goal is to determine if we can meet the needs of the U.S. I think the the use of DLT is still extremely important, and and part of it is also the the upside in in the long run. Uh, we we see a lot of potential um, in in expanding use cases, um, many of which also relate to to financial inclusion.